Hi everyone, welcome to Riot's Lunch and Learn series, the place where we spotlight all of Riot's partners. My name is Caroline Griffin, I am Riot's Director of Operations, and I'm super excited to have Rob Holt with iCertify here today to talk to us about regulatory dot control. Just a couple of quick reminders before we get started. The best way to view Rob's presentation is in speaker view. So if you go up to the top and hit view and then hit speaker view, that'll give you a nice view of his presentation and then Rob himself. Um, this presentation is being recorded. It will be posted to Riot's YouTube channel and then posted to the meetup group where you registered for this event. And then the last reminder is just to please keep yourself muted. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please utilize the chat box and Rob will make sure all of those questions are answered at the end. I will be monitoring the chat box to make sure he gets fed all of the questions. But without further ado, thanks again for being with us today. I will hand it over to Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Caroline, and thanks, Riot. It is uh, good to be with you today as we take a look at some fresh perspectives on regulatory compliance, and specifically today, the doc control aspect of regulatory compliance. And um, the best way to do that would be to start by talking about who we are. We are a conformity consulting firm. We provide a broad spectrum of uh, services from uh, design for compliance services, um, project management for some of the base countries. We can also offer program management solutions. Um, of course, global certifications and type approvals, in-country representation, local holder services, uh, regulatory conformance intelligence, and global um, country reports. Um, authorized representative services, especially in Europe right now. And uh, as we'll touch on here in, in the slide, our certification management services. So what's the problem? Well, what the way I like to look at it is that it kind of starts with the executives. Um, most executives in a startup initially uh, manage compliance as the company grew, but, you know, eventually... Uh, the details grow beyond the ability, the executive's ability to manage, and they have a thousand and one other things to pay attention to, um, not just compliance, but potential product recall issues, are lots of RMA issues, and you know most executives just get overwhelmed. Um, so at some point, the 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 delegation is placed upon somebody, either one or more people, to manage all of the regulatory compliance. However, it is the executive, uh, someone in the organization, director, uh, supposed to be an officer of the company that signs the DOC. Um, and with those kind of people, uh, typically uh, a staff as a company is growing, a manufacturer is growing. Um, you have an engineer who's a design engineer. Um, sometimes there'll be a separate person who does a lot of the validations whether it be on the hardware validations or smoke testing on the software. Um, somebody possibly focused on radio and antenna issues. And uh, if you're lucky, you get a technician to support the team. Um, but the problem is someone in that group or even in outside of hardware um, will, get, will get tasked with the compliance role. I've seen many design engineer uh, have to take on this role of managing regulatory compliance on top of their role as a design engineer. Um, you know, the job description they were hired for does not include compliance, but yet is expected as part of their job. Um, so the conformity learning curve coupled with the workload often leads to people always being behind, working extra hours. And I've seen lots of times burnout and attrition so what should, should organizations think of this role as being? Um, I call it an administrative compliance engineer, someone who can, who can provide conformity assurance for the hardware uh, devices and manages all of the associated doc control. Um, so, uh, other titles I've seen are regulatory engineer, compliance clerk, compliance coordinator, compliance facilitator, compliance librarian, archivist. Um, it's all of the above at the same time. 
Um, now, there has been a move recently to dedicate one individual that is outside of a particular department, maybe someone directly uh, up to a VP or, or the president um, or to the general counsel um, that removes the potential for uh, preferring one department over another. Um, and at some point, it just makes sense to pull back from outsourcing it and, and have some uh, most of these obligations handled internally. And as the company starts to sell products around the world, this can lead to a homologation specialist role um, and eventually even a corporate compliance officer for uh, compliance issues that are beyond uh, you, you know, hardware, software. Um, and you need somebody dedicated to this because most authorities provide only 20 to 45 days uh, to produce requested documentation or evidence. Um, and so you really need to have a, a streamlined process for easy retrieval of needed items. Um, and so to help um, illustrate this, you know, I consider this role to be a hub in an organization with spokes going out to other departments. Um, the first one that would logically come to mind would be engineering or the hardware department. And um, I'll skip a lot of these bullets. This, as Caroline mentioned, this will be on YouTube. You could see all these uh, bullets uh, later, but um, there's lots of documents that need to be uh, obtained from stakeholders in the engineering department and lots of documents that they're gonna need from somebody in this regulatory uh, archivist role or coordinate, compliance coordinator role. Um, same thing in operations. There's lots of documents that um, will be needed from the compliance coordinator and vice versa. There's also going to be a lot of documents in the QA department, which makes sense because uh, as you see on the fourth bullet down, uh, doc, uh, bolded, um, many uh, QA's department will be the ones that handle doc control. So there's going to be a lot of coordination um, with the QA person dedicated to doc control, um, either to assist them or to take, you know, the, for the QA department to sub part of this out to the compliance person for the regulatory compliance documents or both. Um, there's lots of documents that are going around in finance, right? Um, a lot of which can also be used as evidence toward due diligence. So for example, if, if there's a report that gets lost and the, the authorities in Belgium are asking for some due diligence evidence, you, you say, well, I've lost the report, but I, you can see here, I've got POs going out to the laboratory. You know, we paid for testing and a report. Um, you know, you're able to put together a story. So you never want to take lightly a lot of these finance uh, documents. You wanna store them and, and archive them uh, as an audit trail of your efforts. Um, legal. Legal will do lots of uh, um, reviewing of contracts, statement of works, NDAs, servants agreements. Um, and, and so it's, it's, there's a lot of coordination that should happen between the compliance coordinator and legal. Um, if the corporation is publicly traded, then um, according to the Dodd-Frank bill, section 1506 of, 1502 of the Securities of Exchange Commission requirements, then you need to uh, source your 3T and G. Um, you have to source where those minerals come from. We'll touch on that a little later. Um, sales and marketing. There's a lot, there, believe it or not, there's documents that are involved in a compliance coordinator's job to and from sales and marketing. Uh, whether it be regulatory roadmaps or consequences for, um, you know, what are the regulatory consequences if we come out with a, a customer improvement version or a slightly different version with new features or different components. Um, so a lot of times sales needs input from the compliance coordinator of those consequences. Um, one item here that seems to get overlooked is OEM oversight. Um, so when devices are brought into the system that's going to be sold, uh, you need somebody on the team to look over the shoulder of the vendor and make sure that their compliance documentation is, um, is accurate and valid. Um, software firmware. Uh, there's going to be smoke testing involved in many cases that 
um, their, their team is going to archive, but some of some of them is also going to be part of the compliance coordinator job to archive, um, especially some of the due diligence on the frequency allocation protocols. Um, I just saw a fine with a very well known company uh, in the industry. It was a quarter million dollar fine, $250,000 for um, not having the device have appropriate firmware controls to prevent it uh, from being out of compliance. And so they had to enter into a consent decree with the FCC and, um, and ensure that those frequency allocation firmware controls are accurate. So uh, these, these areas are also areas that a compliance coordinator needs to have certain documents um, archived and saved. And for some reason, my enter button is not working all of a sudden. Here we go. Okay, sourcing department. Um, there are things that can be requested of the buyers to help uh, you comply with your, um, with your responsibilities. So for example, um, instead of waiting for a deal to be made and a purchase to be made, and then asking for that vendor to provide you regulatory documents, there can be scripts and um, instructions for the buyers in the sourcing department to make sure that they have uh, certain documents provided before they agree to um, uh, purchase a, a part or a component. Or as you saw in one of the previous slides, when you're 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 buying um, when you're buying uh, something that's going to be integrated like a battery, you want to make sure that all you have you request that documentation and re review it ahead of time before the purchase is made. Once the purchase is made, you have no more leverage <laughs> or little leverage. Um, so this slide helps illustrate for for everyone the high level disciplines that we're talking about. These are high level disciplines that are required at some sort or at some level uh, to be met uh, for um, either quality um, or regulatory. So we've got electromagnetic compatibility um, and you can see there's a bunch of different aspects to electromagnetic compatibility, the digital device side, the RF side, um, making sure that the uh, design for compliance is already built in early on. You've got product safety, you know, NRTL, European, uh, the ICCB scheme. Um, that's for how safe a product is for a given environment, for a given product type. Uh, mechanical testing, a lot of this is for internal benchmarking. But um, again, if there's going to be one compliance coordinator managing um, all of the certification issues and you have uh, certification requirements in one of the uh, one set of requirements are internal benchmarks. Some of the top level ones should be uh, archived as well. Um, so um, I've seen in many organizations that a lot of the top level documents for mechanical testing are going to be housed with all of the other regulatory products. I mean, regulatory uh, documents. Um, substances of very high concern. Those are the banned substances under Rojas, um, the European REACH, California Prop 65. Um, you see sustainability here. That's the uh, reuse recycle in Europe. And many uh, countries around the world are starting to adopt these reuse recycle. You have energy efficiency um, for the uh, adapters and for the battery charging systems. And here we're going to take a little bit deeper look just to help give you the uh, impact of how much documents that we're really talking about. Um, so starting off with that first um, uh, discipline here, EMC, you're going to see that you have an unintentional or digital device side of, of a product. Um, and let me just take a step back for some of those who are really new to, to this aspect of the industry, product development. Um, if you have a toaster oven and it plugs into the wall, that's an electrical device, right? It needs electricity to, to do its intended function. 
Um, if you put a processor in it to, let's say, um, have a beautiful, attractive, fancy uh, display, well, as an unintended side effect, that uh, chip that's in that display will radiate energy. And so the FCC and other uh, agencies around the world want to make sure that the potential for that toaster to interfere with other nearby devices is below a certain p potential. Um, and so that's what we're talking about. Uh, that second section um, is digital device portion. Now, as, as soon as you add a uh, radio module to, you know, Internet of Things, um, now you have a whole set of wireless requirements to meet. So it's electrical, electronic, and radio. Um, so bullet number one is talking about the unintentional side, the, the digital device side. And that's typically done by listening to the device, radiated and conducted emissions. So you're going to have uh, test reports that call out radiated conducted emissions. Luckily, one set of tests can cover all of these countries that um, you see called out in the, in the asterisk. There is a EMI uh, test under part 18 for incidental. Um, it means that the, there's incidental interference that could happen from the toaster or to the toaster. And so that is called out in part 18. So you wanna have a report for that. Um, you've got your EMC unintentional for immunity. So Europe um, don't, doesn't just listen to the device, they wanna do something to the device. So you'll have the inverse of radiated and conducted emissions. You have radiated and conducted immunity where they will introduce frequency in volts per meter uh, to the device uh, for radiated immunity to see if it can handle that phenomenon. Um, conduct immunity is injecting um, uh, frequency in, in volts per meter up the power line. You've got ESD, electrostatic discharge, uh, EFT and surge, both of which are injecting um, energy up the power line. Uh, voltage dips and interrupts is, is seeing how your device can handle brownout situations. And then magnetic uh, only applies to some products, but you know there's going to be a report that will encapsulate all of this immunity uh, testing. That's a high level document. Um, and then you've got your RF, as I was mentioning earlier, this the bullet number four is for the wireless, um, the wireless aspects of things. So um, in US and Canada, they have a modular approval program, which allows you to stand on the approvals of the module that you're buying. Um, as long as you um, follow the conditions of applicability, so the grant of the module will call out certain parameters that have to be followed uh, when incorporating uh, that module into a device. And if you follow those parameters, you don't need to repeat the RF testing um, here in North America, uh, US and Canada. Um, and you get to uh, use that FCID on your product. Um, but of course, you wanna have lots of evidence to that uh, in your files, should you be asked that you can quickly produce um, that you have the grant of the module, that the conditions uh, have been applied to, uh, here to. So, the, you know, sometimes some of these um, uh, vendor docs can actually be evidence of due diligence and, and conformity. Um, in Europe, they, it is self-declarative, but you have no modular approval program. You must um, do RF testing with that module in your device and get a report. Um, and there's a series of different uh, tests and reports that make up what's called the RED uh, report, the RED, Radio Equipment Directive. Um, in countries like Brazil, Mexico, and China, there's no module approval program. In fact, you have to do in-country testing. And so um, that's another set of reports that you will be obtaining and um, uh, archiving. SAR um, applies to many uh, radio uh, devices. Uh, some that are low powered enough can be exempt, but typically you have to do a calculated method to show that you are uh, allowed to take that exemption. Um, but there's more and more countries now that are also following this model. Uh, Mexico just updated their SAR approach uh, earlier this year. Um, then we go into product safety. Um, where in the, in the U.S. you have the nationally recognized test laboratory program. We call that 
NRTL, or some people call it NERDL. Um, it's managed by OSHA, which means that um, any employer that buys a product for their employees to use um, must provide their employees a NRTL listed device. So it's not on the manufacturer to meet um, to meet NRTL, there's no legal requirement that you as the manufacturer must um, have NRTL on your products. However, if your buyers must have it, then it becomes a market-driven thing. You don't want to be in a situation where you lose out on a deal because your competitor does have NRTL and you don't. Um, plus, it also provides some indemnity um, to be able to say that you tested at the highest standards of in the land and the NRTL, which is uh, part of a government agency, OSHA, uh, was able to designate your product as being safe. Um, in the European Union, um, it is required for every device to have met low voltage directive unless it's low powered enough that it, 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 it uh, is exempt from it. Uh, but most ITE will have to meet the uh, low voltage directive, which is, um, pretty much the same testing. Uh, it's about a 5% deviation for, let's say, uh, EN62638 versus UL62638. And uh, similarly, the international um, aspect, the ICCB scheme, which has been around, gosh, 30 years now, up to 52 member nations, um, that is going to have an IC62638. Um, and depending on what countries out of those 52 you pick, um, they will have certain deviations that they'll test to based on the countries you say you want to go into. But the point is, if you're going to go to all three, you can do one set of tests and the, the, the NRTL that you're testing with or the lab that you're testing with can do one set of tests, cover all the deviations at one time, and then create the reports for the different these three different um, uh, requirement uh, US, Europe, and, and IEC international. Um, but of course, you're gonna have to um, house all of those reports uh, efficiently in your system. Um, the mechanical, there's these are a whole set of, um, there could be a lot more than just these four, um, for quality purposes, um, there are some that are not listed here like uh, MTTF calculations and MTBF, you know, uh, between the hard testing like these four you see plus the calculative methods, you can use that for determining warranty, um, you know, what you should set your warranty at. Um, um, there are some uh, standards like NEBS testing and Telcordia testing will call out certain mechanical tests, but for most of the uh, regulatory compliance for ITE and for consumer electronics, I, IoT devices. Uh, this is more of, of internal. And as I mentioned earlier, if it's an internal benchmark, it's helpful to have one coordinator for uh, regulatory requirements, market-driven standards, and internal validations to have top-level reports uh, for how your ingress protection came out. What's your vibration um, and shock and vibe data? Um, you know, you want to ha have that with all of your other documents. Um, and then we've got these substances of high concern. Um, Rojas has 10 banned substances. Reach has, gosh, 211. Um, it looks like my slideshow got a little messed up here in bullet two, but the point is it's uh, not harmonized. It's not part of CE marking. Rojas is, and the way to comply to either is to scrub your bomb against either the 10 banned substances or the 211, or it's probably up to a little more by now, because every six months they can add new uh, substances onto that list. Um, but if you're gonna open the bomb and scrub it for Rojas, you might as well do it at the same time for REACH, even though REACH is not harmonized. Um, it's not part of CE, but it just makes sense. If you're gonna do the, all the work on Rojas, do both at the same time. Then you have your California Prop 65, which is well over 700 uh, substances. Um, and that's a whole nother uh, subject to, get, to do a deeper dive into, uh, but it's still under the banner of substances of high concern. Um, some companies for high-risk devices will do uh, testing and will have reports. 
um, in, in terms of the report from the test lab and also a report from a uh, state approved toxicologist who will review that report and then give you a second report called the safe harbor report another set of documents to cover. Um, we're seeing um, in like your the Eurasia block countries, um, the, the, the ability just to declare conformity to Rojas is not enough. They would like to see a risk assessment, which will um, essentially tell the story of how it was that you arrived at the determination of conformity. Um, did you just gather documents and stand on those documents? Does, when I say documents, DOCs, you know, did you just take your supplier DOCs and say, I stand on them and we're now we're compliant? Um, well, if you've got, let's say, 200 parts and 50 of them are custom parts, the other 150 are well-known parts that have been out in the in the, in the, in, in the ecosystem and in regulatory uh, databases and libraries for 15 years, those are low risk. But the 50 that are custom, you know, what did you do to ensure that what that vendor who's an unknown, new to you, uh, maybe new to the industry, what did you do to ensure that the, that their declaration to you was accurate? So they want to see a, a story of, of how you arrived at conformity. It's kind of a new thing we're seeing, not just in Eurasia, but in other countries. Uh, next year, there's... Uh, new effective dates coming. Um, reuse recycle. Um, this is something that is required to inform the European Union of how much, um, you know, either ITE or batteries. Those are the two paths that must be, uh, if you don't have a battery device and it's just ITE, um, but you must report how much you're going to ship into the country and then the target is a 65% reuse recycle. Um, and how do you do that? Well, one way is to have products returned to your um, to your headquarters or um, you know, a local office in Europe. Um, and you can do that on a regulatory page of your website or through other ways of getting those instructions to your customers. Um, but the requirement, part of requirement for we is to sign up with a producer uh, scheme, which is a fancy way of seeing a, a scheme of recyclers, a consortium of recyclers uh, throughout those 27 member nations uh, of, of Europe, where you um, will give them a certain level of, of data, like your block diagram, your uh, sc sc uh, bill of materials. So they know when a, when a product comes in, what's in that device and where, they disassemble it to recycle it. Um, and at the end of the year, they, that, produce, that recycler uh, scheme that you sign up with will take whatever's been returned and give you a report. You have to combine your internal uh, data with your recycler data and combine those and see if you met the target. It's a lot of extra paperwork, but again, that's what today's uh, topic is about, is managing all these documents. Um, for those devices that go into a hazardous location area, um, there's you know three different, very much like with regular product safety, there's three different um, areas, North America, intrinsic safety, Europe has ATEX and international is IEC. Um, you can do a test plan that will, you know, one set of tests to cover all three, but still you're gonna have a, a report to you know, archive and be ready to show when needed. Um, then you've got issues of labeling, are the right marks on there? Um, what versions are you using now? What version of the user's guide are you using now? When you add a new country, you're going to have to consider, um, is there a certain phrase that that, require, that country requires to be in the user's guide? And does it have to be translated into their national language? Um, then, of course, you've got a new version of the user's guide. That new, the, 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 the latest version should be part of your compliance coordinator's uh, set of documents that you have set aside in some place. <laughs> Hopefully not a C drive. Um, and then of course you've got type approval certificates. So if you've got your FCC report, um, a lot of the uh, South American countries uh, will accept FCC. Most of the other countries in the world wanna see a European red report as, as your base uh, document of evidence and then some other um, uh, requirements they want to see. But then you're going to, going to, you're going to be receiving what is called a type approval certificate, what you would call a grant for FCC or a grant for Canada. 
Uh, the rest of the world we typically refer to as a type approval certificate. Um, and those are typically going to be uh, either permanent or one year term, a three year term, a five year term. So you, if you've got 20 countries, so, some are, are permanent, some are going to, uh, you know, expire in one year or so, some are going to expire in three. So you have to keep on top of making sure you don't let a renewal um, slip and then it's a lot more painful to have to do it again versus just renewing. Um, so now let's talk about a system. Um, sometimes you can produce and launch one product that's a standalone product that doesn't need any other devices to operate. Um, makes your job a lot easier. There's less documents to manage. Um, but I'm going to give you a, uh, an example here of a system. So a system will typically have one core device. We refer to that as a equipment under test, EUT, or a device under test, DUT. Um, and that's going to be the, the core device. Um, the other devices for certain purposes, like uh, you know, a digital device testing for FTC or for Europe, are going to be considered as accessories. Um, it, but if, for example, if this device can be uh, operated as intended while charging, it's going to have to go through its testing uh, in, in, in the, while charging as well. Um, and so that's going to be called out in the report. The report's going to call out, you know, this device is operated by battery. Here's the battery. Here's the, the battery charger. It's all going to be listed out in the report. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in this uh, presentation, each of these uh, have their own reports to, 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 to vet before you uh, agree to integrate that into your system. Um, so in this case, for this example, um, this is a Wi-Fi mesh enabled radio. Um, and so it's going to need the unintentional uh, digital device testing. Um, it's going to need, uh, uh, well, uh, as I mentioned on the last slide, if it does not, if it's not able to operate while charging, if it can't do that, then all you're going to need is radiated, uh, radiated emissions and radiated immunity. Sorry, this slide has a typo. I meant to say all it will need is radiated emissions, radiated immunity, and ESD. Um, so three tests to meet digital device. And again, um, I mentioned earlier that, that that test, that radiated emissions, radiated immunity, and ESD, the report for those three will be good for Europe, US, Australia, Japan, Taiwan, or Korea, typically. Um, if, if the device can be operated as intended while charging, then you need the full suite of tests, all the conducted and all the immunity tests. Um, it's going to need wireless testing. It's going to need product safety, right? Um, and in this case, you you buy a battery, for example, as you see here on bullet, or the first bullet under two, you buy a battery and it's going to have UL, let's say, for example, or CSA on the cell on the pack. But now you roll it into your device and now it's the, the NRTO is going to consider it as part of your system, they may or may not need to do some additional testing. Uh, typically they don't if it has its own cell and, and pack uh, NRTL, but still the your NRTL is now going to uh, call that out and there's gonna be requirements around that battery. Um, and if you add batteries um, for different, um, you know, uh, different uh, capacities, it's gonna have to be added to the report. But for this core device, you're going to have to do wireless testing, product safety, substance of high concern, um, and uh, we. Now, we were just talking about the battery. The battery will have to have its own testing done. Typically, the battery manufacturer will, will test it in a representative end use scenario. Um, However, some, like this battery here, was custom made for this uh, manufacturer. 
So they may be asked by the manufacturer and should, you should ask for your battery manufacturer to run through their paces and do some um, cursory testing. The, they may say no, so that you're gonna have to run it yourself in your, in, in your system to make sure that it doesn't fail uh, unintentional EMC. Number two is, is not non-negotiable period. Um, this is the transportation requirements, which means um, lithium batteries are not, will not be allowed to be shipped by air without having a UN 38.1 um, transportation certificate. Um, you can still ship it by ground, but it won't be able to be shipped by air. So that's, when you're buying batteries, that's, that's a starting point. Um, as I mentioned a second ago, product safety needs to be performed on the cell and the pack. So um, when you're negotiating with the battery manufacturer to buy it, you want to make sure that they have some done some EMC. Sorry about that. EMC. Um, they've done their NRTL and their IACCB scheme already before you buy it. Um, that could take three to six months, but that's that. that my suggestion is you require that um, because if you don't, then the NRTL that's going to be certifying your system will have to do all that testing and the cost will be exorbitant. Um, of course, the battery will need substance of high concern. We um, validation testing. Now the charger for that battery will also need some testing. So unintentional EMC, it's going to need product safety. Um, so when buying a battery charger from a battery charger vendor, uh, manufacturer, you want to make sure um, that it's done some, you know, representative end use testing on the e EMI, um, EMC, and it has its own NRTL and CB scheme. Again, you know, you don't want to have to pay for that when you go to your NRTL or your, your which typically will, will also act as your CV for IC. You don't want to have to repeat that testing. So you want to have your vendor provide you that. And uh, on the IAC CB scheme side, um, they may give you a CB report and let's say it covers 10 countries, but you're selling to 15. Well, you have to decide, do you want to pay for, to, to, to add those other five countries or make your vendor go back to their NRTL and CB and retest to add those five as part of the condition of buying? Um, someone's got to pay for that. And so um, I've seen situations where they will discount the price, the vendor will, so that the manufacturer can just take that extra step and, and test. Hopefully there's not a, a failure. <laughs> um, but somebody's gonna pay for that testing. It's best to have it done by the uh, vendor. And again, you wanna make sure that the country's covered um, in the CB report of the countries you intend to ship to. On the energy efficiency uh, side, um, there's going to be energy efficiency uh, uh, aspects because this battery charger will be powered by an AC adapter. And together as a system, that's called BCS, battery charging system. And so you will, will take it to an energy efficiency lab, get you know uh, your, your data showing you pass or in a report. Then you also have to register that with the California Energy Commission. Um, if you're not on their list, if you haven't registered, um, things can get pretty ugly in terms of fines and possible recall from the state. Um, you're gonna, you know, the, the battery charger will need Rojas and Reach as well as part of your uh, Wii for Europe. Now the AC adapter, same thing. It's going to need uh, the digital device portion, uh, documents you're gonna get from them, product safety you're gonna get from them. Same scenario, they want to cover the countries involved that, that you're gonna be shipping to. Um, and then on the energy efficiency side, energy efficiency side, it's not gonna be a BCS, it's gonna be a EPS where you're gonna test just the adapter and you're going to uh, call out uh, the on your marking what rating you receive. So some countries will accept a Roman numeral five, others wanna see a Roman numeral six in terms of the higher, the highest right now is six. And then you need to do uh, registration. 
um, as well. So in addition, you're going to have to uh, uh, take that report and register with Canada and also with Australia. Those are the two countries that require registration. And of course, the adapter is going to need Rojas and Reach and we. There are uh, other um, uh, the pieces of your system that also need to be uh, addressed. Um, so this lanyard typically uh, will lay on the skin of the user all day. <laughs> For this particular system, it's a lanyard-based radio that they're wearing. Um, and so what inks are in there? Uh, for the label, for example, for packaging, what were the adhesive and inks made? There's a packaging directive for Europe that wants to know that. More documents to acquire, more documents to archive. Um, and then you've got reuse recycle requirements under the packaging directive, more documents. Um, it's just, it never stops. Now on some IoT devices, like the system I've been talking about, this Focera system, are body worn. And in that case, you're, you'd be well advised um, to get telemetry testing done. Uh, the top lab is the Georgia Tech Research Institute. They're the top lab doing telemetry testing. Uh, but it's very important because let, let's say uh, you have a nurse and the hospital saying you must wear this as part of your job. She's like, I'm scared, I have a pacemaker. Um, then the hospital can go to you as the manufacturer that, and you can give them a telemetry report uh, documenting that your device is safe within a certain um, distance from the pacemaker. Um, another report to archive and uh, manage. We touched on this before, but for the uh, conflict minerals, if you're a publicly traded company, um, you must source your 3T and G, your tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold. Where did it come from? Which mine? Believe it or not, they want to know which mine. Uh, the Republic of Con is, this has to do with the Republic of Congo and all of the eight surrounding countries. Um, where did your minerals uh, source from? And it may not be the mine. It could be that you got it from a smelter. Um, but you want to be able to show your due diligence that you were able to source it. And then uh, there's a CMRT, the Conflict Minerals Reporting Template form. That completed form will get rolled up into your uh, SD report that gets filed annually with the SEC. So it's another document or set of documents to um, uh, archive and be ready to show. Now, as you many have heard Brexit, um, they just announced... Uh, you know, that they're, they've left the EU and there's a whole set of marking and other types of requirements. Um, just yesterday, I mean, late in the day, too late for me to strip this slide out. They've pushed it out to an effective date of 1123. So uh, manufacturers have more time to meet the UKCA. However, in, in the EU last month, uh, July 16th, they started a new market surveillance regulation. Um, and as the name suggests, it's a new way of surveilling the market. Um, and it has to do with a, a number of different things. But the, the most important is that you must have, if you're shipping into Europe, you must designate an authorized rep, a legal rep who will hold your technical file for 10 years. So that will require whoever your representative is to review your technical file if it's accurate, then he or she will, that entity will act as your rep and be the first person that the authorities talk to if there's an issue. Um, that person will also get the fine, not you as a manufacturer. Uh, but there's a new DOC format, which uh, entails a batch call out or a serialization call out. Part of this is because they want to have some method of recall, the way CE marking was set up in 96 when it first came into effect. Um, there's just no way of tra tracking. So with this new system, if each DOC has a range, um, then they can um, track it through you as a manufacturer to the importer, to the distributor, to the line of service provider, which line of service provider would be a brick and mortar store or a amazon.com. Um, the last person to sell it to the end user. So each of them are gonna need that DOC because they need to know who they sold it to. Um, 
and there's legal responsibilities along the way. Um, in bo both directions, there's legal responsibilities for each of those economic operators in the chain. Um, and so that's a whole set of other you know, documents. Part of um, the onus on the importer and the distributor and the line of service provider is to show that they have done some due diligence in terms of making sure to a certain level that the certification documents from the manufacturer are accurate. So you may get um, you know, uh, stakeholders in that supply chain coming to you saying, I need this, I need this, I need this. Point is, that's a lot of documentation. Um, I didn't even touch on biocidals. Um, the Vocera system has biocidals. You need biocidal reports. Uh, biocidals is when there's, uh, you know, uh, preventative uh, substances injected into the plastic. Um, it just, it never stops. There's so much documentation that goes into um, testing to and launching a product, whether it be in the United States, Canada, or Europe, or anywhere. There's a lot of documents, and they all need to be managed uh, efficiently and um, in a way that is easy to retrieve at a moment's notice. And so now that we know the problem, let's talk about uh, the solution. So luckily there is a guide, an ISO guide. Um, used to be the, the main guide was 19600, but earlier this year it has been replaced by ISO 37301, Compliance Management Systems Guidelines. It provides guidance to establish, you know, set up and develop and implement, evaluate, maintain, and improve uh, along the way, an effective and responsive compliance management system within an organization. So you don't have to, you know, construct the wheel from scratch. Um, this ISO guide helps you follow a best practice set of um, processes that can help you be more efficient than if not, you know, if you don't follow them. So in the, in section 3.24 kind of talks about what this slide deck so far has been talking about, um, how the information needs to be controlled and maintained um, on the medium of which it's contained. So that could be a C drive, right? <laughs> Less startups. Um, somebody in the organization is saving these on a local drive. Uh, not, not suggested, not wise. Um, I can't tell you how many times we've gotten calls when I used to work at the labs and they've lost the reports and they're asking if we can res resend them the reports because they, they literally lost them. And it happens on share drives. We've had companies who... Uh, keep their documents in a share drive and they still seem to have gotten lost. Um, it happens. Um, in the last year, we've had two companies uh, at iCertify where they had a ransomware event and uh, they lost a bit, you know, they lost their certification documents. Um, and it's really sad. They have to re reconstruct everything. Is it impossible to reconstruct everything? No, but it's a huge object. It's a huge undertaking. So um, the medium on which it's contained is important. You know, where is that, where all these documents housed? Um, and so you see on note number two, you want to have the information created in a way that it's not only safe um, and easy to, to navigate through, but also has a way of displaying the evidence of the results. So you can easily access those top level declarations and reports and certificates, you know, at, at, at a moment's notice, hopefully. Um, procedures, the section 3.25 talks about uh, the ways of processing and controlling these different documents. And it, it establishes, you know, there's methods that it establishes for you to help, you know, implement and maintain secure archiving as well as have an audible uh, trail of both your, your compliance documents and in some cases, the ECO docs, you know, which version was uh, uh, initiated when, you know, the timestamps. 
Um, the takeaways are is you want to have a, a system that is uh, efficient, right? With the rules-based engine that provide an upfront checklist of all documentation and data required to support regulatory classifications and, and obligations. One that enables stakeholders to self-serve when submitting documentation through a secure online web portal uh, in an effort to introduce convenience, tracking, and security into the document uh, creation, document collection process. Um, you want to have it centralized. Centralize all your compliance and data, your, your documents, reports, all your evidence, your documentation in a single view, like a dashboard, enabling businesses uh, both, you know, uh, internal, you know, stakeholders in different departments, or even outside of your organization, to be able to access, search, and retrieve documentation, um, and ensure regulatory coverage through document auditing. Um, you want to be able to um, show how many documents are held and how many are outstanding. We talked about um, certain type of approval certificates having certain terms, right? And so you want to set up a rules-based uh, compliance determination to show uh, what needs attention when, so that you're just not uh, winging it, that it's, it's all baked in on the front end. Um, and so that helps to have a uh, algorithmic or rules-based system to automate uh, this system to alert uh, the compliance manager of key renewal dates. Um, there's seven that I've seen that are very important to keep in mind. Um, you want to establish a comprehensive document control procedure um, per that ISO guide. Um, develop workflows for all document types. And then have a siloed or decoupled repository for all compliance documents. Um, and you want to don't, not forget to consider how best to configure metadata. Um, if you're not going to have a uh, a, a, a portal-based system, like a third-party system that uh, can tag things for you. If you're going to do it on a shared drive internally, like SharePoint or Agile, then consider using metadata for quick retrieval of uh, certain documents per keyword. Um, of course, you want to protect the data integrity. Um, that the the uh, you know revision revision controls or, or in revision audit trails, you know, time stamping is part of it, but also uh, from, from hacking and ransomware. Um, change requests, revision control, and obsolescence processes are important. And uh, you want to have the ability to uh, report. So you need to build in re integrated reporting capabilities. Um, what can I, uh, I certify do to help? Well, we have some Thing that we built out just for this situation, which is a fully encrypted certificate repository um, that allows you as the manufacturer to manage and track all of your global, you know, domestic and international type approval certificates within a single interface. It is a secure portal and it allows you to track certificates uh, through a um, either internally or through uh, partners in a very easy to access site. And you can uh, use queries and run reports based on some criteria like brand, model number, country, expiration date, certificate number. Um, we're in a process right now where a manufacturer wanted us to tweak our system for their use case. So the ability to um, pull by certain criteria can be expanded based on your uh, particular need. Um, the the rules-based system that I touched upon uh, is integrated here. We will send out a notification uh, to the key point of contact within your organization uh, 90 days prior to an exp uh, expiration date. Uh, this will ensure that the expirations are not overlooked. And then subsequent notifications are sent. Uh, both in, in our company and to your point of contact uh, 60 days and 30 days out. The dashboard uh, is very key. It, it gives you an overview of all of your uh, certificates and your regulatory documents. Um, it lists out you know, links to the, to the different versions. Um, 
shows what's expiring this month, what's expiring, expiring next month, what's expiring in the next 90 days. Um, and it's very easy to add new certificates, to upload certificates is a very easy system to use in that regard. Um, and you are able to upload uh, documents that are not issued by iCertify. It could be any or all of your regulatory documents um, can be um, housed through the iCertify system. Um, the top level, right? Docu documents like reports, declarations, um, COCs, DOCs, things like that. Um, it, it does have the ability for multi-user access. So you have your unique login credentials, but other team members, um, you know, regardless of location can, can log in. Um, and you can add people to that list of notification, but you could also set it up for um, your clients or your vendors. So it's, it's, and within that, there's different permissions within what they can see, what they can't see. Uh, so it's very customizable to um, third parties that you, you might want to have access, but you want to dial in what they can see and what they can do. Um, good news, it's free to any of our clients and it's available for self-service um, to be able to you know, add documents, build it out yourself. If you uh, have need of our ability to uh, you're just too busy and you say, look, I just, I like, I like this idea. I'd like to try it. I'm just too busy. Um, there are options available for us to use our expertise and go through your different disparate data sets and upload them and link them for you. Um, or there's also options for training in terms of how to, to set it up. Um, we have uh, the ability to train you, your company in iVault, or if your company uh, uses an ECO management tool like Arena Solutions, um, we can uh, show you how to use the Compliance Manager module, how to set up the requirements and the categories and how to link those together. Um, you know, not just how to do it, but how to maintain it over time. So we can, you know, we're, we're available for training and teaching and equipping in that regard. And uh, with that, Caroline, that's my, um, my, uh, my, uh, my presentation for today. I'll hand it back to you, Caroline. Thanks so much, Rob. That was a great presentation. I see a couple of questions here from the audience. Um, we'll just go in order. The first one is in regards to the iVault. Is this run only on iCertified servers or do you offer this for deployment on private cloud? It's on our servers, yes. Awesome. Thank you for that, Rob. And the second question is also about iVault storage limits. Is there a size of data to retain a, a limit on the size of data? No, not this time. All right. Let me scroll up. Um, this one here. Could you please touch on medical devices? For example, 510K devices that include electronics, firmware, and Bluetooth wireless. What are the pre-compliance review recommendations if that is within your practice area? Great question. 95% um, plus of our clients are considered a, a, an RF device, right? Um, either Wi-Fi or cell or LoRaN, um, Bluetooth. Um, and sometimes uh, we'll have medical device manufacturers coming to us but it's not for any aspects of clinical or any of the uh, case study management uh, you know, documents. It's typically for the regulatory uh, requirements that the device must meet uh, that are non-medical aspects of the medical device. Um, so we do have solutions for the non-medical side of a medical device, right? That would be the digital device side, the RF, product safety, Bluetooth certifications, which we do offer uh, Bluetooth. Uh, we have a BQE uh, on our team that can, can help with uh, mapping it out, getting the testing done and, and registering. Um, but uh, the medical device side of medical device devices is not something that uh, we've really delved into at all. 
Um, that said, if you want to use I certify for uh, your um, certificates on the, you know, for EMC product safety, and you want to add some other documents that are uh, part of your FDA requirements, um, iVolt can be used to house those documents, but we, we wouldn't be able to help give you guidance on pre-compliance uh, for FDA. We can give you pre-compliance, like design for compliance on the EMC side, uh, construction reviews on the product safety side, things like that. Hopefully that answers the question. Thanks so much, Robin. If not, um, we can connect you directly. Um, next question here, looking for differences in certification requirements for a power supply versus a power adapter. Most international markets differ in these requirements. Would I certify have any references to these requirements or a resource? Yes, so we have a Nardi certified engineer on our team. So um, he's been at this, gosh, since 1978. So he's been doing this over 40 years. Um, and Nardi is the highest level of certification that product safety engineer can, can, can get. So if you've got a question of uh, what, what regulations apply, what is the best designation? Is it, a, is it an adapter, a power adapter? Is it a power supply? We have resources to help guide you in that area. Amazing. Thanks, Rob. And we'll take one more question here. Ownership of the data is in the gray area. For example, even if the law dictates that for privacy reasons, the data cannot be shared with iCertify.com within government agencies. However, these days the government upon calls can force iCertify.com to disclose their data like they did for Facebook and Google. Do you have insurance for that? Um, if you're asking me if the, I think what you're asking is um, if we have a secure um, repository and we meet a whole list of requirements to be able to say that it's fully secure and I can provide that to you if you want to email me later. Um, that's one thing we are asking. It sounds like you're asking if the government comes to us and says, we'd like to have access to this company's uh, product data, or at least their certificates are listed on the site. Uh, without a warrant, you're asking if we would share that uh, without a warrant? Uh, we've never been asked that question. I would assume my, uh, my administration would say no. Without a warrant, we would share nothing. But uh, if you could email me and clarify your question, I'd be glad to answer it in more depth later. Awesome. Very helpful, Rob. Thank you so much. Again, thanks again to everyone for attending. Thank you, Rob, for a very informative presentation, as always. Please reach out to Rob, rob at icertify.com with any questions. Of course, you can always reach out to Riot. Um, we appreciate your time, Rob. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Bye.